Dr. Lambert, welcome to the Tick Bootcamp Podcast. Thank you. We are really excited to have you, and uh, I'm sure folks have already detected you a brogue, so why don't you first share with us uh, a little about your background and uh, and where you're from. So so, so, I'm, I, so I work in Dublin, Ireland right now, but I'm actually Scottish, so, so, uh, so I was born in Scotland. My parents immigrated to America. That's why I have an American education. Um, and then I moved back to the UK in 1999 and then ended up in Ireland. And I've been there for the last 18 years um, as an infectious disease specialist. So that's my the short, short synopsis of my life. All right. So, so build out a little bit more your uh, your education in the U.S. So where where we where was where did you uh, where did you go to college? Uh, where did you go to medical school? And you also have a Ph.D. So why don't you build that out for us? So 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 I so I actually went to um, I went to uh, college uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So my my parents immigrated to Indiana. So I went to un- college in Indiana. I went actually back to Scotland for a period of time to go to the University of Stirling, and then actually realizing how difficult it was kind of being in that transition. I, I, I was looking to go to medical school in Scotland, but uh, the system is quite difficult once you've left the country. So I finished my university degree in Michigan um, and then went to medical school at Michigan State University. Always in, always interested in infectious dis- and tropical diseases. So that was always an interest of mine. And when I completed my training, moved out to Rochester, New York, completed my training in medicine and pediatrics. And then, uh, so, I, so I'm qualified as a general pediatrician, a general um, internist, you know, and then completed my infectious disease training in Rochester, New York. So I jointly in infect pediatric and adult infectious disease. And then my first kind of worked in academics at the University Hospital in Rochester for a couple of years, and then moved down to Baltimore where I worked three years at Johns Hopkins and three years at the University of Maryland Institute of Human Virology before, you know, kind, kind of long story, but I had three kids. Uh, um, I was raising them on my own. Being in Baltimore was quite a challenge, and and I, I kind of made the decision to move back to the UK uh, more for family reasons than professional reasons because uh, I had a really great job in, in Baltimore. So so my experience in Baltimore, you know, was was infectious diseases, uh, you know, uh, mostly virology, um, but I did I did learn a lot about tick-borne infections in my time in Rochester, my time in Maryland, and then I moved back to the UK in 1999, worked for five years in the UK before I found a job in Ireland, kind of the job that I had that was kind of similar, um, you know, in terms of quality as what I the job I had in Baltimore. And I, I, my plan has always been to move back to Scotland, but I, I quite haven't quite made it back there yet. So I continue working in Dublin, Ireland, um, as a as a professor at UCD School of Medicine, and 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 uh, a consultant in infectious disease at the Mater Misericordiae University Hospital. So it's the teaching hospital of the UCD School of Medicine. And I also run clinics at the mat- big maternity hospital in Dublin, because one of my interests in pediatrics and maternal fetal transmission, um, I run a big a clinic in infections and pregnancy at Rotunda Hospital, which is one of the big maternity hospitals in Dublin. Wow. So that's a pretty impressive resume. So uh, talk to us about how you got to where you are now. Um, meaning, when did you first uh, develop a passion for uh, the healing arts? Uh, did you know you wanted to be a doctor from an early age? Or was that something that uh, something that developed in you, uh, that desire developed in you later on in your life? Yeah. No, no, no. I think I, I always was kind of programmed to go to medical school. I don't know why. It was always something I was interested in doing. But I kind of saw myself working more in tropical medicine. You know, this was before HIV came along. So I was kind of interested in tropical infectious diseases. I actually did a stint uh, leaving Rochester and going down to Baltimore. I worked in Haiti for a while at a mission hospital there. So I, I always kind of had interest in working kind of international working and tropical diseases. And actually, when I moved, when I, I started working in Rochester in my fellowship, I was working on uh, dengue fever. I was working on yellow fever vaccines. I was, I was, I was more involved in tropical medicine. And then HIV came along. This was in the 
you know, the eighties and I was in, I was in New York state. So a lot of my early work kind of shifted to HIV. A lot of my research work moved to HIV. And I, I was one of the first people actually to work on mother to child transmission of HIV and working on pediatric AIDS. So that really kind of was my kind of claim to fame in America was work, you know, I, I was jointly qualified in adult and pediatric infectious diseases. Nobody was really interested in taking care of the children at that time. Nobody was interested in taking care of the pregnant woman. Everybody was, everybody was afraid of HIV and AIDS. The obstetricians wanted to protect themselves. They didn't want to take care of the pregnant woman. So I kind of, I, I developed an interest in infections and pregnancy uh, with, with HIV being, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 the main thrust of my work. I, you know, I, so, I, so I've actually developed programs for uh, through the AIDS clinical trials group uh, in America uh, on treatment of HIV in children, uh, treatment of pregnant women with HIV. Um, and then a lot of my research early on was work through NICHD, National Institute of Child Health and Development. I, I, I obtained a number of grants in the US before moving back to the UK, focusing on pediatric AIDS and mother to child transmission of HIV. So that was kind of my my work prior, prior to moving back to the UK and Ireland. So talk to us about first, what is an infectious disease doctor and what was it about that discipline that attracted you uh, to the uh, infectious disease space? Right, well, 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 first off, I never liked surgery. Um, so I, I could never be an obstetrician. I don't like blood. You know, I could never be a gastroenterologist. I, you know, I don't like the smell. You know, I could never be a cancer doctor because I don't like to see dying people. So I, I guess the the thing that really kind of excited me about infectious diseases, you you actually have the ability to cure people. This is kind of the challenge, you know, and 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 even with HIV, it's not curable. I had reservations about going into HIV because they were all dying in the early 80s, you know, but but actually becoming a part of that effort. We now have treatments for HIV. You, you can't cure HIV, but people live a normal lifespan. So my interest has always been curing people. And infectious disease is one of the few, I think, uh, disciplines in medicine where you can actually potentially cure people. So that that really has always been my, my, my what, what kind of, you know, you know, keeps me running, you know, keeps me excited about working in medicine, the opportunity to cure people, get them better. So let's define infectious disease doctor because we interview many different people on this podcast. So we're, we're at well over 400 at this point. And uh, each of you looks through a very different prism. So give us a, a, a definition of infectious disease and the prism through which you look through when you're, uh, when you're uh, diagnosing and treating a patient. Yeah. Well, I mean, infectious diseases are, are are pretty much everything. There's bacterial infections, there's fungal infections, there's viral infections, there's spirochete infections, which are a form of bacteria, which Lyme disease is, there's, there's infections that, you know, so, so different. So there's so many opportunities in infectious disease. Um, like recently I've attended an infectious disease conference, um, you know, in Boston and, and, you know, you, 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 you get to get updates on coronavirus, you know, COVID-19, uh, you know, I just listened to, you know, presentations on HIV and AIDS. I listened to presentations on tropical medicine, you know, travel medicine, you know, developing new vaccines for, for chikungunya, which is a viral infection that, you know, that, 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 you know, is spread by mosquitoes, you know, so, so they're, 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 it's such, it's such an exciting area, infectious diseases, because there's so many different areas that you can work in. You can work in virology, you can work in transplant medicine, you can work in HIV care. You, I mean, it, it, to me, it's one of the most exciting areas of medicine because it's challenging because people present with um, such a myriad of symptoms. You know, it's not that clear cut when somebody walks through the door, um, you know, the, their liver's inflamed, there's, their kidneys are not working their brain's not working, their platelets are low, their hemoglobin's low, 
they have these undifferentiated fevers, you know, I mean, I think it's absolutely, it's an absolutely exciting area to be involved with. It's kind of like a Sherlock Holmes type thing. And one of the, the doctors I worked with in America, you know, who, who kind of mentored me in Rochester, New York, that there's a textbook of infectious disease called Mandel, Douglas and Dole, Dolan, Practical Principles of Infectious Disease. My boss was a guy called Ray Dolan, who, who then moved on to be, you know, associate dean at Harvard Medical School um, after he left Rochester. And he basically taught me that, you know, a good infectious disease specialist is a good internist. We take care of every organ system. You know, infectious diseases damages every organ system. And rather than saying, you know, the kidney problem is separate from the heart problem, it's separate from the lung problem, it's separate from the brain problem, we put we kind of put these problems together into one unifying diagnosis. And that, that's kind of, that kind of excites me. That, that's what I really like is, is, you know, seeing patients with these, what I call mystery illnesses very often and trying to figure them out. And once you figure them out, you potentially can get them better, which is absolutely rewarding. So focusing a little bit more on the uh, infectious disease element of the work that you're doing, and then I want to talk to you a little bit more about uh, the tropical medicine. But let's say focus on, on on the infectious disease. So would I be correct in in uh, defining an infectious disease doctor as, as a doctor who examines patients to determine the microbial um, cause of the multisystemic illnesses that they're presenting? Absolutely. That, that, that's exactly what infectious disease doctors do, you know, and then and then even more importantly, um, you know, the other exciting part is being involved, not just in coming up with a diagnosis, but coming up with therapeutics. You know, when I started in HIV and AIDS, there was no treatment. There was no drugs available. And then then AZT became available. And then I was involved in the, the studies that in, involved the second drug, uh, which was called DDI, you know, and then I was involved in studies to treat pregnant women with the HIV medicine. So the babies didn't become infected. So, so that's, that, that's kind of the exciting part is not just coming up with a diagnosis as big coming up with therapeutics to get people better. Um, when I moved to um, Dublin, um, in 2005, there was no good treatments for hepatitis C. You know, now we have cures for hepatitis C. And I was involved in, you know, working with the pharmaceutical companies and enrolling patients in studies to, to determine whether there was new drugs that worked better uh, to, to, to treat people for hepatitis C. And now, you know, th those studies started in all over the world and in Dublin, where I worked, um, in 2008. And now we have one tablet that you can take for eight to 12 weeks and cure people of hepatitis C, which is absolutely a miracle, you know? So, so this is the, so the exciting part is, is as you said, of infectious diseases is coming up with the diagnosis, but to me, the equally exciting part is coming up with treatments that potentially mm -hmm. can get people better. And, and it seems to me that one of the things that's really exciting about doing the work that you're doing in, you know, in the spirit of defining you as a medical detective or, or a uh, medical Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. is that you're, you're going to have a, a, a large number of, of, of microbes uh, somehow getting into the human body, which is then going to interact with other microbes that the body has been harboring. And this multi-systemic um, illness is going to present very differently in every single person. And as a result of it presenting very differently in every single person, when you're coming up with a, a, a treatment protocol, that's going to be, that's going to necessarily have to be individualized between you and your patient. Right. And absolutely. There's, like I said, that that's exactly the situation. And I think that that applies to most infections. There isn't, uh, there's guidelines, um, but you don't treat you you don't treat people by guidelines, you treat people according to their clinical response. And I and I, I say this all the time. The guidelines say treat a skin infections, a cellulitis for seven to ten days, but in some patients it takes four weeks of antibiotics to get the skin infection better. So so yeah. So so I think you know part of the art of infectious diseases is is applying the guidelines and treating the patients, not the guidelines. And, and, and that really is 
you know, that really is the ongoing challenge for whether it's HIV, whether it's Lyme disease, whether it's COVID, long COVID, whether it's hepatitis C, whether it's tuberculosis, you have to kind of individualize treatment. And that's kind of the fun part. It's, you're not following a recipe. You know, you're, you're actually trying to, trying to, you know, kind of monitor patients, evaluate patients, see if they're responding. If they're not responding, you modify treatment, you know, but, but like I said, the exciting part is the end game is getting people cured. And it is really the exciting part of, of clinical medicine. However, it's also risky. And one of the things that I really admire about doctors like you is you recognize that um, you know, the, the treatment protocols that you're given are not going to apply to many of your patients. You're going to have outliers and you're going to have to take some risks when you're treating an outlier because you're not going to necessarily use generally accepted medical practices in order to be able to uh, cure these people. And that in, in many cases has put uh, some of the best Lyme doctors in a position where they find themselves coming up against medical boards and in some cases being sued because uh, because the, the standard for malpractice actions is generally using generally accepted medical practices. But quite frankly, if you're an infectious disease doctor, there really is no such thing. Right. No, and, and absolutely. And I think that that's that's really the situation. I mean, I've, you know, going back to the early days of HIV, the guidelines were to treat people with one drug, which didn't suppress the virus. Um, so when three drugs became available, some of my patients came to me and said, I want to go on triple therapy. And my first response is triple drug therapy isn't approved. But then when you start thinking about it, the, the problem is not the, if the patient wants the treatment and the treatments are safe, you know, that then what's the downside of giving them triple therapy? The downside, there is no downside. The upside is that the guidelines a few years later changed to put people in triple therapy. So, so you don't always have to wait for the guidelines to treat people. I treat people with long COVID. There are no guidelines to treat long COVID. I've established my own guidelines, you know, and I know my, I know the treatments I'm doing are getting people better because I monitor patients. I do questionnaires before and after treatment. I see how they respond. You know, so I can um, I can be criticized using long COVID as an example for managing long COVID patients, but many of my patients get better. And most of the other clinics that patients go to with long COVID, they get test after test after test after test. And then they get basically told every, all your tests are normal, get over it. Well, you don't get over it. So, so five years from now, we will have guidelines for long COVID. Um, but I've kind of I've started seeing long COVID patients three years ago, um, early in you know the the first wave of of COVID, um, and I started seeing these patients not getting better, not getting better. So you start kind of looking at thinking out of the box a little bit, using off license indications for certain treatments, and then when you see that those treatments work. You actually keep records, document, publish. And this is the thing that, 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 that you can use to avoid the situation where, you know, doctors are treatment off, are treating, you know, off protocol and they get sued and they get their license taken away. You know, my, my approach is I can stand behind everything I do and I can actually provide, you know, detailed explanation. And if anybody says you shouldn't be doing this because it doesn't work, my response very simply is, well, I have publications to show it does work. You show me publications to show that it doesn't work and they can't. So, so I think, you know, sometimes you, you, you do have to stick your neck, neck, neck out, whether it's long COVID or Lyme disease or, going back to the days of HIV, but, but as long as, you, as long as you can, you know, practice good medicine, not do anything crazy, do things that are safe and actually monitor, you know, your treatment response and your patients then, and be able to publish that, then, then I think that's the best defense. 
So, you know, one of the things I, I think is also exciting about uh, interviewing infectious disease doctors, is in many cases, there is a bright line between researchers and clinicians. But I think I think in your profession in particular, the, the line is not so bright. You are part research, researcher, part clinician when you're working with all of these people who are <laughs> suffering from these multisystemic diseases from polymicrobial, polymicrobial infection. So you really have to sort of be have a foot in each camp if you're going to be a successful um, infectious disease doctor. Do you, do you agree with that or, or do you have a different take on that? No, 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 I absolutely agree. But, but, but moving on to Lyme disease, for example, I think, you know, I mean, one of the criticisms of Lyme disease is people, people do things that are way out there. And sometimes, but they, and they don't record their results. You know, there's, there's more experts in the world on Lyme disease but they're self in some ways they're self-appointed experts you know and 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 if somebody criticizes them and asks them to kind of show you know show their data you know explain why they're doing what they're doing show their success rate they can't show it because they've never published you know and this 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 is really this is really you know part of the challenge so i i you know i i think the biggest like I said, the biggest, uh, you know, strength that I have for, you know, it, you know, I think I was quite wary about getting involved in Lyme disease at one time because I, I was aware of the shark infested water waters, you know, but I think I, I, I kind of put together a plan and a strategy that if I was going to do it, I was going to do it in a way that would help patients, but also protect myself, you know. And the way you protect yourself is you practice good medicine, you practice safe medicine, you record your results, you publish your results. And I've published, you know, not to brag, but I've published just using COVID, for example, and long COVID since, for, since three years ago, we've got probably 25 publications, you know. Wow, congratulations. Um, just 25, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and if you look at most of the quote unquote Lyme literate doctors, they they claim to be experts, they claim to be widely published, but the way you find out if people are published is you do a PubMed search and you check on PubMed, you put their name in. And I actually did that today. Um some of some of the experts, you know, on 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 Lyme, who claim to be experts in Lyme disease, but if you actually do a PubMed search, their publications are one or zero. This is their whole career. 30 years of their career. So 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 I just I just think that that the the, the challenge really is is that is is that it's I think Lyme literate doctors, you know, are doing great work. Um but sometimes they 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 really don't have the evidence to support the work that they're doing. And sometimes they make claims that they they've they've done great work. Like for example I work in Ireland. A lot of patients in the UK and Ireland go to go to Europe to get private treatments in clinics. And you know, I've gone to some of the patient group meetings, and you have some of these centers in Europe that come and they say, you know, we're a world, you know, leading experts in Lyme disease, widely published, et cetera, et cetera. Our data on hyperthermia for treatment of Lyme disease, you know, is shows that everybody gets cured. But when you actually look, they don't have any publications. They claim to have publications. So so the, the, this, the, this, this, the dilemma of Lyme disease is, I think really is that it's an unknown area. There's not good funding in the field. Um, the Lyme literate doctors are not part of mainstream and they're managing most of the patients and many times they're doing good work. But sometimes some of the claims that they make are are not backed by good signs. And I think that's an important uh, lesson for our listeners to to keep in mind, uh, because, you know, part of making a decision about whether you're going to work with someone is 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 an element of due diligence. And your due diligence should include speaking with other patients and certainly doing a PubMed search to make sure that the folks who are making the claims that they're making are not in fact snake oil salespeople, but they are in fact um, folks who are doing work 
on the research and clinical side that is uh, that is respected and 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 hopefully published so that uh, so that the results could be examined not only by the patients themselves but by other people to see whether or not you know the 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 uh, the claims are replicable and and can be supported by the you know the the general community. Absolutely. And I think that that's important. I mean, I mean, I see lots of really sick patients, whether it's long COVID or chronic Lyme. And, you know, they've gone so many different places and they've been turned away and they've been rejected. And they've had some people get pretty desperate, you know, people get pretty desperate. And and like you said, they'll that sometimes they they jump for the snake oil um, because they're desperate and they're, they're kind of misled. So um, I'm not saying every Lyme literate doctor is is you know is is practicing that way, but I, I do think you know that that you you do have to have a high degree of skepticism, and you should do your homework. You should do your homework ahead of time to make sure that um, that your investment of money and time to get these treatments are have a good chance of succeeding. Yeah. So um, before Matt is jumping out of his seat, as as, as you can see, so I, I do want to I do want to develop one other line with you, and then and let Matt start asking some of his questions. That is, uh, Dr. Lambert, we've we've um, found it a little frustrating as a podcast on Lyme disease when we've tried to ask people to come up with a definition of Lyme disease, and and at one point I said to Matt, uh, we have almost as many definitions of Lyme disease as we ha we have people that we've interviewed. Um, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why we have so many diagnostic challenges uh, in the community, because it doesn't appear to be a consistent definition. So we've come up with a definition for Lyme disease here at Tech Boot Camp, and I'd like to run that by you and get your reaction to it. So uh, our position is that Lyme disease is a polymicrobial, multisystemic, chronic infectious disease. What would your reaction be to that definition of Lyme disease? Well, actually, Lyme disease refers to just one bacteria and that bacteria that was discovered going back to old Lyme Connecticut was the bacteria called Borrelia. So actually Lyme disease is one bacteria. Well, so now, now let's explore that together as an infectious yeah. disease doctor, the folks that you've treated, and we'll just focus on live for now, mm -hmm. have any of them really just been uh, exposed to a single bacteria or have you found with your patients that they have a polymicrobial infection, either because they were harboring bacteria and viruses and protozoa that their immune system was managing, and then this combination of new new uh, microbes being spit into them causing them to be sick, or were they were they um, were they overwhelmed by many microbes being spit into them by a tick that had had bitten them? I mean, or or is it been your experience that uh, folks are sick from what we're now defining as Lyme disease uh, when they get bitten by a tick, or it's passed on you know in some downstream way uh, ways from only one bacteria? Right. So, so, you know, you asked me for a technical definition of what Lyme disease is. Um, so, like, so, so I think in answer to your question, probably both things are going on. So the longer you have Lyme, I think the more damage it does to your immune system, the more immunocompromised you become. Kind of sounds like similar to HIV back in the olden days. The lower and lower your immune system you get, the more likely you are to catch other infections the more likely you are to get reactivations of other dormant infections that you had in your system, bacteria and viruses. So, so I think, you know, that, that Lyme does, Lyme, longstanding Lyme disease causes a degree of immunosuppression. And in that setting, I think you get reactivation of a lot of endogenous infections, infections that you had prior, you know, or, you know, that, that you could have had from childhood, you know, who knows? Um, Second thing is ticks carry lots of different bacteria. We only focus on Lyme disease. In Ireland and UK, you can only get tested for Lyme disease. If you ask to get tested for um, anaplasma rickettsia, et cetera, et cetera, you know, it's very difficult to get done. Um, so I think co-infections are the rule rather than the exceptions. If you look at studies from, you know, the Hudson, upstate New York, where they actually, you know, biopsied patients with the ECM rash, 
and were able to isolate Borrelia. So you know that they actually were infected. Research laboratories can do that. 10% of them had Babesia. Um, if you look at the ticks in Ireland, University College Dublin Vet School have done studies. They've taken the ticks, done PCRs on them, you know, ground up the ticks and isolated the PCR, uh, the, the, the DNA. They found anaplasma, rickettsia, Babesia, and Borrelia. So it's likely that when somebody's bitten by a tick, they have lots of different infections. There's just there's a big outbreak now that's been publicized in the UK press about tick-borne encephalitis. You know, tick-borne encephalitis is is you know highest highest numbers and record in Scandinavia this summer because of global warming. It's all over Eastern Europe. There's a vi vaccine for tick-borne encephalitis that you take if you live in Eastern Europe. You know, um, the ticks are now kind of migrating on the geese obviously coming over from Scandinavia, landing in UK, going into the grass and biting people. Now now we're seeing people in the New Forest, which is the southern part of England, in Devon, which is also the southern part of England, and he heading up northeast to Norfolk, and they're bitten with tick-borne encephalitis. So, so to support your point, we call it Lyme disease. You know, people are beginning to kind of step away from... Lyme and say Lyme and co-infections. I th still think Lyme is the probably one of the critical infections, probably one of the more pathogenic infections, you know. Um, but I, I think it is polymicrobial. Um, so both bacteria, multiple bacteria that, that take, can inoculate into your body, and then lots of dormant bacteria. There's intracellular bacteria that people have, and there's in viruses that people have that I think are getting reactivated in the setting of, you know, chronic persistent Lyme and immunosuppression. However, it's not been well studied, studied you know, and, right. and, and, and if you look at private laboratories, they'll have people test for, you know, 15 different pathogens and they'll do antibody tests and they'll say, oh, you're infected with all these viruses and bacteria and they are causing your symptoms but you don't really know because an antibody test when you when you when you do these tests these tests are your immunological memory you need a pcr you need to culture the bacteria the virus to actually prove that it's replicating so so we're still limited in our technology and this is one of the challenges of of tick-borne infections you know tick alignment co-infections is we've got poor diagnostics and and you know it's a bit of a guessing game to be perfectly honest as to you know what if you don't remember the tick if you don't remember the bullseye rash you know when people present to you um since we don't have really good technology to prove active infection um it's a bit it's, it's, it's a bit of as a clinician <laughs> It's a bit of a guessing game as to what infection is actually in the system causing all their symptoms. But 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 Lyme, in my opinion, is 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 really probably the critical pathogen. Uh, and other infections kind of also can play a significant role, viruses, bacteria, you know, other infections um as well. So Dr. Lambert. The laboratory piece of it, although, you know, for sure, these direct direct detection PCR tests are probably better than these immune response tests, they're still not perfect, right? And, yeah. you know, we we know from doing our research on you, Dr. Lambert, that you have an affiliation through your, your Lyme awareness not-for-profit and T-Labs and Dr. Robert Mazayenin, we're going to get into all that, right? But we still know these tests aren't great. So understanding that tests aren't great for Lyme and various co-infections and understanding that, you know, as you said earlier, generally you as a practitioner, and again, I want to point out you, I think Dr. Lambert are the exception rather than the rule when it comes to infectious disease doctors, right? Most infectious disease doctors do follow the guidelines, unlike you, right? Most infectious disease yeah. doctors do look at Lyme disease as a singular textbook definition as you first described with rich which is borrelia burgdorferi sensulato right if are you infected with this and they, they rely on unreliable tests to even prove if you have borrelia burgdorferi but myself and many others in the community get sick with lyme and many other things for many 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 years we get treated with doxycycline or IV antibiotics we don't get better 
We're then told it must be something else. And we're left to suffer for quite a while because of all these things, right? So how do you as a practitioner overcome these problems? You mentioned that you have to do these types of publications to protect yourself as a doctor. But a lot of this, you have to do anecdotal studies to then prove out these studies that you can publish, right? To then use that to protect yourself. So there's so many, I think, barriers here to treat people with guidelines that don't fit a lot of people, with bad testing, right? And then with this standard definition of Lyme disease, when in many cases, it's much more. So how do you overcome all those hurdles as a practitioner treating people with Lyme disease and chronic Lyme disease or really aggressive Lyme disease in your field? Well, you know, you, you, you've asked me about 10 questions there. But look, if you look at the Irish guidelines, the Irish guidelines say treat with 10, 10 days of doxycycline, end of story, and you're cured. I mean, even today. And actually, I, I told you I'm at infectious disease meetings and I was at meetings with uh, some of the people who actually put together those guidelines. And some of the, they actually tried to put guidelines in 2018 in Ireland that even without treatment, Lyme magically disappears. It just goes away without treatment. So this, so of course, yeah, there's probably 35 infectious disease doctors in Ireland, and there's one of me. So it really is a bit of David versus Goliath. Um, be, but if you look at the infectious disease textbooks, I, I told you my mentor, Mandel, Douglas, and Dolan, which is a classic infectious disease textbook used by all infectious disease doctors in America, um, principle and practice of infectious disease. They, they, they say Babesia only happens in patients who've been splenectomized. Otherwise, you know, you just magically get Babesia and clear it. So, so, so the challenge really is, 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 is even beyond that, is that the specialists who are being trained in tick-borne infections, if you look at the textbooks that they're, you know, that they're reading, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, that's what it says, you know, is it says Lyme, easy to diagnose, easy to treat, all these other co-infections are of questionable significance in humans. So th this is really the challenge, you know, that, that, that goes along. And you can't, you can't get funding for Lyme disease. The NIH, the National Institutes of Health in America, I think have, have come up with 5 million a year for Lyme testing. I just spent time at Infectious Disease Society of America conference which is 10,000, you know, infectious disease doctors from all over, over America presenting data on HIV, you know, with funding from the NIH. I mean, last, last time I looked at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, they're funding 1.8 billion for AIDS, HIV research. And we already have treatments for HIV, good treatments that give people a life expectancy greater than somebody who's HIV negative, you know, and we continue to put money into HIV and we put all, almost no money into Lyme disease. I ran into one of my colleagues who is interested in pediatrics and I asked her about Lyme and pregnancy. Uh, you know, she's kind of a, a preeminent professor in Long Island. She sees lots of kids and, and you know, she says, well, I'm not sure if Lyme transmits in pregnancy. I'm on the edge, you know, I, I'm not saying it does happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, you know, and, you know, I've, I've actually published a lot of reviews on Lyme and pregnancy and there, and there've been textbooks with chapters on Lyme and pregnancy, you know, congenital Lyme that magically disappeared, you know, so there's, there's, you know, from, from the medical textbooks, you know, put together by colleagues of mine. So, the infectious disease community, which is 10,000 strong, Infectious Disease Society of America, you know, basically Lyme is easy to diagnose, easy to treat. It's not clear whether Lyme transmits in pregnancy. Uh, it's not even identified in the pediatric red, red book, which is the American, you know, kind of book that pediatricians use for every infectious disease. It doesn't even mention congenital Lyme. And when I approached the NIH a few years ago about could we put together an initiative on looking at Lyme in pregnancy, similar to the work I did before in HIV in pregnancy, that was one of my one of my interests, part of my funding that I had when I was working in America. And I worked really closely with the National Institute of Child Health and Development on HIV in pregnancy. I said, could we do the same thing for Lyme in pregnancy? They said, no, it's not even identified 
as a possibility in the pediatric red book. So, so we're challenged, you know, as far as that goes. So my approach is I, I see patients, I guidelines are guidelines, you know, um, there's nothing in those guidelines that say I can't treat people for longer. Most of my colleagues in the closet treat people with Lyme for longer. They just don't have the the guts, you know, to to say they're doing it. You know, there's lots of data coming out now from private funding that you know that Lyme persists. That even six months of IV antibiotics in some situation doesn't eradicate the spirochete. Um, but the Irish guidelines say 10 days of doxycycline and you're better. And I can give you case after case after case, you know, where patients come in and say, oh, this doctor, I went to the infectious disease doctor, you know, and they said to me, you've had your 10 days of antibiotics. Um, we can't give you any more. The infection's gone. And when they say, you know, um, but I got better the 10 days of antibiotics and I stopped the antibiotics, I got worse. You know, I can teach my labradoodle that, you know, oh, the antibiotics were doing something. Antibiotics work against bacteria. So, and if you got worse after stopping the antibiotic, if it's any other infection, any sensible doctor and my labradoodle as well would say, oh, you need a longer course of antibiotics. But with Lyme disease, no, you've had your course of treatment. The infection's gone. We can't give you any more treatment. I don't practice medicine that way. Um, and I feel quite comfortable doing that, to be perfectly honest, because um, this is the way you practice infectious diseases for every other disease area except for Lyme disease. And it's, it's, it's a paradigm. It's, it's a paradox. It's a puzzle. Um, but, I, but I treat patients, not guidelines. And I stand by that. So, Dr. Lambert, we've had a lot of people come on this podcast not only talk to us about the Lyme does persist, right? In research studies, Dr. Alan McDonald did a few. He came on. We've had a lot of other researchers on that have done these studies to show Lyme persists after prolonged extended antibiotic treatment, even never mind short term antibiotic treatment. So it sounds like the first barrier we're having here is this. Most people believe a short course of antibiotics will cure Lyme disease. But I think the second barrier we're looking at here is will a long term treatment of antibiotics cure Lyme? And we've had people come on and argue the answer is no, because when we use antibiotics, the spirochete will kind of shrink up into a cyst form, which doesn't get addressed by antibiotics. And when the antibiotics are no longer being introduced into the body, it unravels again back into a spirochete. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that beyond the length of treatment with antibiotics, that the bacteria is smart enough to kind of avoid antibiotic treatment and then shift change, like many people say that are out there in the Lyme community? Or do you think that's just a false a false rumor? Well, I don't think, I, I don't think it's necessarily a false rumor, but you, you actually have to kind of look at other disease areas. If you, you know, like, so I treat all infectious diseases. So if I treat tuberculosis, tuberculosis is an intracellular organism. You, don't, you need to treat with four antibiotics for a minimum of six months and sometimes 12 months and sometimes 18 months. And if you don't use rifampicin, which is a really good antibiotic to penetrate deep into intracellular into the tissues to kill off the tuberculosis germs intracellular, you can't go six months. You have to go 18 months. So there's all sorts of guidelines for treatment of other intracellular organisms you know, with longer courses of antibiotics. And and there's all sorts of theories that, you know, doxycycline is driving the infection. It's it's knocking down the infection, but isn't eradicating the infection. I, I, I guess we don't know because we haven't done studies. You know, so I, I've got lots of theories, you know. So so I've got lots of theories that that if if somebody shows up a year with after a missed Lyme diagnosis, it's much more difficult to treat than if they show up three days after being bitten with a bullseye rash with aches and pains all over. And that and that's no different to another infection that um, that I occasionally treat. Farmers get an infection called Q fever. And Q fever is, is caused by a bacteria that comes through the lungs. And if you catch it within the first month or two, four weeks of doxycycline, Bob, your uncle, you're cured. But sometimes 
it just you just get a transient infection of the lung and then it disseminates into the body it disseminates into the the bone marrow it disseminates into tissues of the body the liver a year later you shop and you're diagnosed q fever it's 18 months of doxycycline and hydroxychloroquine to cure people so we have for for other infections we've got a definition of early early treatment early diagnosis versus longer term treatment but it does if you've got Lyme for five years and somebody finally diagnoses you in Ireland it's 10 days of antibiotics if you're caught within two days it's 10 days of antibiotics there's no differentiation of you know the duration of the infection and if the infection is longer like I said I, I think it's more than I think it's still potentially curable and people talk about going into remission I, I just think that you never really cured it you never really eradicated the infection and why why is that we don't 100 percent know but i can give you another analogy back in the olden days when we used to treat people with hiv and aids there was no treatment so regardless of what you do their immune system their lymphocytes get lower and lower and lower and then they finally get aids and they developed all these infections and they developed reactivation of infections and then when i treated them for these infections they got better and when you stop the antibiotics or antivirals or antifungals, the infection came back again because they didn't have an immune system to work in combination with the antibiotics to clear the infection. So the thing that clears the infection is not just the antibiotics, in my opinion, it's repairing the immune system, especially people with more longstanding infection, you know? Um, and I think that's critically important. So the three I's, infection, inflammation, damaged immune system, you have to address that. And then the interesting story from HIV is once we get treatments for HIV, the antivirals, people's immune system, their lymphocytes went back to normal. Their lymphocytes, the T helper cells started working, you know, and then next time you treated that infection, the infection went away and it stayed away because you treated with the right anti-infective and their immune system was working in combination with the anti-infectives and they cleared the infection. And I think that really is a challenge with, with, with quote unquote chronic Lyme is it's more than just the, the infection, it's repairing the immune system. You have to do more than just treat with antibiotics. And that's what I used to do when I, 10 years ago, when I first saw, saw patients with even chronic Lyme, I just started treating them with antibiotics and they got better. And when I stopped the antibiotics, they got worse. It wasn't until I started adding in things to repair the immune system. I started adding in, adting in things like LDN, low dose naltrexone, which was actually used back in the day of HIV and AIDS before there was treatment for HIV and AIDS. It has had anti-inflammatory effect, immune modulating effect. It gave people with HIV, there's placebo controlled trials in LDN. So, so when I, when I see people with early Lyme, I just treat them with antibiotics, but when I treat people, you know, and usually that does the job and how long do I treat them? I treat them as long as it takes till their symptoms go away. Um, and that can, sometimes that's just a month. Sometimes it's two months, sometimes it's three months. Um, but if if I see somebody that's been infected for years and years, I, I I really not don't just treat for the infection or infections. I also do things to target the inflammation, do things to target the immune system as well. So it's interesting because it seems like, and here in the states, we this is not commonplace at all with infectious disease doctors. But many people who have this podcast will have late stage Lyme disease, right? At that point, it's probably further disseminated into the body because you've had it for so long and you're probably immune compromised from the infection. So if your argument, which you know I think most people that have come on this podcast agree with, most experts and leaders in this field, that the immune system has to be addressed as well. Otherwise, the antibiotics are a band-aid, right? The antibiotics will give you temporary relief. And when you go off of them, you may get sick again because your immune system is not functioning the way it should to help you eradicate the bacteria. Why aren't we considering using immune modulation or immune supportive either drugs or herbs or low dose naltrexone etc as more commonplace to supplement antibiotic treatment to get a larger percentage of people with late stage line better well i you know you, you're asking the wrong question i'm doing that i don't know why 
other people aren't doing it. Um, you know, very simply that, you know, you, you kind of learn from experience, you know, you know, you, if you treat people and they get better and if you stop the treatment, they, they get worse. You either need to treat them longer or you need to kind of do something more than you're currently doing. And when I see people with longer, long, you know, you know, I can give you a few examples. When I see people with chronic Lyme, some of them have lymphocytes, you know, T lymphocytes that are 200, 300, similar, you know, back in the olden days, if your T lymphocytes, T helper cells were less than 200, that gave you the diagnosis of AIDS, you know, and then you were prone to catching all the opportunistic complications, you know, CMV reactivation, zoster, all the viral reactivation, fungal reactivation, bacterial reactivation. So, so I've just kind of developed my own protocol based on, you know, working in this area. And I always tell patients, you know, I think you can cure Lyme, um, but sometimes all the antibiotics are doing are is stunning the infection, not eradicating the infection. And what you want is not a stun gun approach. You want the Uzi approach. You want to kind of kill them off, not just stun them. And I think in some situations, antibiotics alone are just knocking them down, but not eradicating. So we're, we're kind of agreeing on this. Um, but 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 like you said, you can't you you can't do a study on this stuff because there's no funding, because in the medical community there's still no acknowledgement that there's chronic Lyme. How would, you, how would you define chronic Lyme? I'm sorry to interrupt, Dr. Limber. How would you define chronic Lyme, right? Because we hear about acute Lyme disease, chronic yeah. Lyme disease. You know, how do you just give us your definition of those two terms, acute Lyme and chronic Lyme? All right. Well, well, look, any any infectious disease, let's look at other infectious diseases. Um, if If you get hepatitis B and you haven't cleared it by six months, 90% of people that get hepatitis B clear it. 10% are chronically infected. If you have hepatitis B, DNA positive, after six months is chronic. Same thing with hepatitis C. So, so I'm, I'm not sure that definition has been made, but that's my definition. My definition of chronic Lyme is you've got it for six months and you still have symptoms, you know? That, that, that to me is chronic Lyme, you know? You know, that that's actually a very clear definition, and I think that makes a lot of sense, so thank you. And I do want to ask, because th there's some conflicting information, or maybe it's a lack of understanding on my part, when it comes to the immune system and Lyme disease, right? So we understand that Lyme will compromise or weaken your immune system. And you mentioned that the immune system is so weak, it's comparable to somebody with HIV because it's so, it's so weakened and not doing what it needs to do. But then we hear a lot of people tell us that they have autoimmune diseases, from Lyme or Lyme can mimic autoimmune diseases. And I understand that to be an overactive immune system attacking healthy cells in the body. So it seems like that's not really in line where in one scenario we're saying it basically obliterates your immune system where it doesn't work. And then people were, were saying in another area, well, it's causing your immune system to overreact and attack healthy cells in your body. So can you help us clear that up? And, and if I misstated anything, correct me there. Yeah, well, I, you know, I don't think it's that simple. You know, it's not that simple. It's like when people with HIV and AIDS, before they died, their lymphocytes got lower and lower and lower. Lymphocytes help you fight infection. Lymphocytes help you clear infection. And T helper cells orchestrate your immune system. They control B cells. They pro control antibody production. They control your immunoglobulins. So I would say you have a dysfunctional immune system rather than a weak immune system, okay? So that's it. So you, so yeah. you have a dysfunctional immune system. In some situations, it, it's overactive. Sometimes it's underactive. Sometimes your immunoglobulins are low. Sometimes your immunoglobulins are high, but it's dysfunctional. And if you look at everybody with HIV and AIDS, they often have a, they, they often have a high gamma globulin level in the body but they, they're making antibodies that are dysfunctional antibodies. They don't work well. They have polyclonal, if you'll do what's called a, uh, an electrophoresis of their, in, and look at their immunoglobulins, their immunoglobulins are all over the place. So they're not, they're making antibodies, but they're not making good antibodies. So they have a dysfunctional immune system. I'm just using kind of analogies for other diseases to kind of apply it to, to Lyme my understanding, but it, like I said, an awful lot of it is theoretical and you get release of these 
you know, there's a lot of, when you get destruction of these cells and stuff, you get release of all these chemokines, cytokines, IL-2, IL-6, you know, there's all, all these different, you know, tumor necrosis factors. So you're getting release of all these, you know, infl inflammatory cytokines, you know, kind of, uh, you know, things that are released that, that cause inflammation. So, so I, like I said, I, I still stand by the fact the longer the, the disease is in your body, the more damage it does to the immune system. And, and like I said, there's, there's clear analogies with COVID now, you know, when you get long COVID, you know, you have the same kind of pr processes going on. You have your lymphocytes go down, your lymphocytes become dysfunctional. You get the development of autoantibodies, you get all sorts of inflammation in the body. And we've learned more, I think, about I've learned more about Lyme disease, chronic Lyme disease from working the last three years in long COVID, because there's millions, if not billions, been put in publications on 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 long COVID. And I I think there's an awful lot of similarities in terms of the the symptoms and the brain damage and the 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 autoimmunity and the immune dysregulation and, and the inflammation that goes on in both diseases. And I think it goes back to the three eyes of what make people sick that you talked about earlier, the infection, the inflammation, and the immune dysfunction. If the immune dysfunction results in inflammation because of the cytokines, it perpetuates a cycle. And if you don't address the immune system, uh, which is causing inflammation, and you only treat the infection, we're reducing our odds of success in treating patients, right? So this is coming back to what you said earlier. I'd like to ask you, though, Dr. Lemon, to respond to something, because some, we posted something recently in the last week or two about a comment by Judy Mikovits, and she made a claim, and you know it, it caused a lot of anger in the Lyme community, but she basically said, there's no such thing as Lyme disease. It was and always is HIV AIDS. And you know it seems like such a radical statement, but can you respond to that comment? I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, or if you've read up on any of, any of this in the last couple of weeks. No, no, I haven't. I haven't at all. You know, I haven't, I haven't read any of this stuff, but... I mean, it just seems seems a bit absurd, you know. But I've had I've I've had infectious disease doctors in in Ireland come to me and say, oh, even if when patients were antibody positive for Lyme, when there was a history of a tick bite, and they'd given the three weeks of antibiotics and didn't get them better, um, and I treated them for longer, they said it's not Lyme disease; it's probably some mystery retrovirus that they have. And my response to that is that yeah retroviruses respond to antibiotics, don't they? Um, no, they don't. Retrovirus responds to antiretroviral antivirals. But you know, but there's huge, there, 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 there's huge anti-science in the infectious disease community and a huge unwillingness to actually look at the complexities of Lyme disease, you know? So this is what you're dealing with. You know, I, I just think it's, it's a bit of a puzzle. I'm I'm on the editorial board of a number of journals now, and and you know, it's almost imp impossible to get published because if you try to publish something in Chronic Lyme, you get an Infectious Disease Society of America reviewer who comes who shoots down your submitted manuscript, basically saying there is no such thing as Chronic Lyme. When I try to get, when I, 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 you know, I, I get grants from HIV, from hepatitis, from COVID nineteen, from long COVID. You know, I successfully as an acad, you know, I, I, I do bench to bedside. That's kind of I, I'm a clinician, but I, I see myself as an academic clinician. I try to get funding for Lyme disease. You know, tick borne infections. I sub, I submitted a grant, um, to the European Union. And it was based, it was the three eyes, infection, inflammation, autoimmunity. And part of the study was actually to do, to go internationally, to look at tick-borne infections in Belize, because I've done training courses in the in the Caribbean and Central America on sexual health. And I know the Minister of Health and my son's godmother was uh, PAHO director for Belize. So I had good connections. And the plan was to look at the tick-borne infections in Belize. And what my I get well reviewed by four of the reviewers. Reviewer number five basically tore apart my my application, including comments like, I have a delusional misunderstanding of the epidemiology of tick-borne infections in in Central America. 
there's no evidence that there are ticks in Belize. And even if there were, there's no evidence that they bite humans. So this is, you know, I mean, seriously, this, 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 this was the reviewer. So, I mean, I get such a bad review. It sabotaged my grant. It was rejected and I couldn't even reapply the following year. And interestingly, uh, my colleague in the Caribbean, uh, you know, in Belize, uh, the Minister of Health was hosting a group of scientists from America, from the University of Notre Dame and Mayo to discuss tick-borne infections in Belize. And there's a, the Mayan ruins in Belize, there's about 10 of them. One of them is called Cajopec. And Cajopecs in Mayan means field of ticks. So 2000 years, the Mayans knew that there were ticks in that area, but my grant was sabotaged. And when I actually tried to contest it and find out who the reviewer was, it was total cover up. They wouldn't give me the name of the person. So there's, there's a huge bias in the medical community and in the scientific community against Lyme disease. Um, I'm just giving you my experience, you know, uh, with me applying for grants. I, I won't even apply for grants anymore because it's a waste of time to spend all this time and effort putting a grant together and then getting a reviewer telling me I've got a delusional misunderstanding of the epidemiology of tick-borne infections in, in Central America. And, and having my grant sabotaged. The same thing happens time and time again, I think for a lot of um, publications that people try, I, I, I can give you example after example, I've had to override negative comments from reviewers who tried to sabotage publications on chronic Lyme, um, you know, over the last year or two. Um, it's, 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 if it, it's a puzzle to me, because I think we should be excited about new science, about learning new diseases. You know, the, the patients patients are always right. There's something wrong with them. Um, we, we should be supportive of patients. That's why we went into medicine. But when it comes to Lyme disease, you know, I, you know, GPs and infectious disease clinicians as a rule kind of grow horns and they, 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 they close the door on the patients and they close the door on the science. And it's really frustrating, but we still applaud your desire and your hard work to get these publications studied. You mentioned you have 25 just in COVID alone and, you know, a ton of others, it sounds like. And you're still looking for better testing to be able to prove people have Lyme disease and possibly that it's still there after treatment to have these definitive markers to prove things and not have anecdotal, you know, suggestions about, about Lyme disease. So ironically, there's a lot of things over the last week that have brought us back to you, even though we had this interview on Friday. We had somebody reach out to us on social media asking us about T-Lab. So we started doing a little re you know, research on T-Lab, haven't heard of them before. And of course, we found your Lyme group, the Lyme Resource Center, posted a YouTube video with the founder of T-Lab, Dr. Robert Mazayan, or uh, Mazayani, I believe is his yes. name. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So can you just give us a little background about what your work is through the Lyme Resource Center and how that led you to do this YouTube video with Dr. Robert with T-Labs? Well, actually, um, I, I just established a what's called the Lyme Resource Center um, is, is, is just as basically a, a charity to really focus on education and training and prevention. And I actually planned and setting up an island. And when I tried to do that, um, the infectious disease the doctors of Ireland en masse came against me and prevented me from doing it. it you know, it, it actually, there was a hearing at the Oroctus, which is the Irish Senate, you know, the government Senate. And I, I actually presented um, to that group on behalf of TikTok Ireland, the Irish charity, and the Department of Health and the infectious disease doctors in Ireland came basically to sabotage me without my knowledge. Um, so that's 2018. So a bit scary to be, uh, you know, it, it's all on YouTube video. It was recorded on uh, RTE, which is the Irish kind of public television so it was all kind of it was totally ambushed when i when i did that so i actually set up the lyme resource center in scotland and we we've done a number of gp trainings and i run a conference every year in dublin called the crypto conference and the crypto conference is um was actually the, the brainchild of a doctor in france called christian perone and christian christian basically um was basically fired from his job for standing up for Lyme disease and standing up for long COVID and COVID. But nonetheless, 
he's he's kind of a, a very talented guy. And we've ran three conferences in Dublin and we brought together scientists from all over the world. And one of them was was Mosan Yemi. And Mosan Yemi was a previous president of ILADS. And he he he's actually quite interested in Bartonella. And his opinion is Bartonella is probably even more, you know, common than Lyme disease, you know, because the if you look at the symptoms of Lyme disease and the symptoms of Bartonella, they're very simple, similar. And actually, when I treat people for Lyme disease, chronic, I treat them for Lyme, but I treat them with combination antibiotics that cover Bartonella as well, um, because the challenge is, is it's quite hard to diagnose. But anyway, most of Yemi's worked with the University of North Carolina, the vet school, and they actually have, you know, the vets are really good at treating Bartonella. The, the vets are really good at treating Babesia. The vets are very good at treating um, you know, Borrelia, all these infections, and they have PCRs available. So, so Mosan Yemi's worked in collaboration with the vet school and Univer University, of North, I think North Carolina State. And I think he's had a spin-off laboratory where, where he's put together some diagnostics. So I, I just kind of work with them kind of collaboratively. Um, and that presentation was just one of the presentations that he gave at the crypto conference that was held this spring in Dublin, Ireland, you know? So that's interesting because Ed Breitschwert is from the University of North Carolina as well. We've had him on the podcast and he branched off to form Galaxy Diagnostics. And we talked all about that. So it sounds like this is somebody else out of University of North Carolina, this Dr. Robert Mazayeni, and he's now forming T-Lab as well to help specialize in tick-borne diseases. Exactly. And I think Mosin Yemi is, I don't think Mosin Yemi is a, I think, he he he's he he's actually I think Washington D.C. based actually, so he collaborates with the laboratories in North Carolina. I'm not you know I I actually don't I don't know the details of I'm not involved in any commercial way with these guys. I just kind of work, you know, professionally and and they've got some good they've got you know some some good ideas and 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 this is not the kind of presentation that would ever be allowed at you know the infectious disease meeting in Boston that I'm currently attending, it just wouldn't be there. It wouldn't be there. There, there needs to be a forum to where like-minded scientists can get together to present the information. I'll, I'll give you one interesting anecdote though, is that um, we've been working with on GP training um, in the UK with a number of GPs and, you know, the, 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 the UK, Scotland, and England are not happy that we have the proceedings from the crypto conference on posted on the Lyme Resource Center. Wow, how is that? You know, it's sort of like it, it's sort of like every level because it, it goes against the teachings in the UK. In Scotland, they, about six months ago, they had a conference in Northern Scotland called the the Northern Tick Conference. For some reason, I wasn't invited to. I don't know why, because I'm Scottish and I do clinics actually in Scotland as well in the Dublin. But none, and I've got this Lyme Resource Center. We're the only charity in Scotland that is focused on tick-borne infections and we're the lead trustees. Um, I'm the lead trustee for that. But nonetheless, that, at that conference, they had a closed meeting. They invited IDSA thinking clinicians from Scandinavia who basically said, Lyme is easy to diagnose, easy to treat. Um, two weeks of antibiotics, you're cured. There's no evidence that longer course antibiotics work. And indeed, longer course antibiotics is dangerous. See, so by me having a Lyme Resource Center that is putting together scientific presentations that goes against that mantra, I think is threatening to them, to be perfectly honest. Um, we just actually published in Microorganisms Journal, if you look up, there's a recent publication by one of my medical students at U UCD, and name is Dave David Z, XI, um, and it's Microorganisms, and it's, it's longer course antibiotics in a cohort of over 300 patients from Dublin, Ireland, and the data from that basically said about 70% of the patients improved based on questionnaires on longer course antibiotics. And this was, you know, two to four to six months of antibiotics. 
And of 301 patients, only one patient couldn't tolerate the antibiotics. So this the so I see patients, I follow them longitudinally. The people at the Northern Tick Conference have been told it's dangerous to treat with longer course antibiotics, but I have publications otherwise. But I'm not, I was not invited to this meeting to present that data. So it really is kind of it's a closed shop. It's really a closed shop, you know, for 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 people who are not following IDSA guidelines, you know, Lyme is easy to diagnose, easy to treat. There's no such thing as chronic Lyme. And a recent public, like I said, a recent submission to a journal that I edit, um, two of the reviewers just basically blew out of the water because they talked about chronic Lyme patients' experience, you know, quite uh, uh, of having to deal with the healthcare system. And the response from the reviewers, they just blew it out of the water saying there's no such thing as chronic Lyme, even though there was a whole paragraph in the manuscript, you know, showing the new science, showing there's a lot of data coming out on chronic Lyme, Lyme being isolated. There's private research going on, you know, through the Cohen Foundation in America, you know, at Tulane, at Stanford, um, at Columbia, at Johns Hopkins. There's a lot of new science coming out, but that science is been totally ignored by you know the 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 standard practitioners so so it, it's an ongoing challenge so i i keep on publishing um but the, the 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 greatest satisfaction is is just taking care of the patients and and trying to get them better um with the approach that i've developed but we don't have a standardized approach because there is no recognition that lyme persists <laughs> And please keep publishing, right? I mean, to your point, we have a lot of people here in the States. We have private and public money being pumped into Lyme disease research because, you know, the case of the Cohen Foundation, a family member was impacted by chronic Lyme and they pumped a ton of money into it. So the more people that are impacted by chronic Lyme, the more money we're going to have being pumped into research. And I think we're getting somewhere where it's becoming very difficult to ignore these studies coming out of major universities here in the U.S. So I think, uh, I'm hopeful at least that that's where we're going, but you talked about, Dr. Lambert, you know, being able to treat people and help them get better. Obviously, you talked about a wide variety of antibiotics. You do a combination of antibiotics. You do LDN, which we'll get, I want to get to in more detail later. But for the for this question, I want to ask you about Monica Wild. So we've, we've chatted with her a little bit, you know, in the past. And we saw in doing research about you that you've done some videos with her as well. And it looks like you've kind of at least looked at using some herbs so Monica Wild being an herbalist, right? And you've you've done some videos with her. Do you use herbs as well to treat your patients in collaboration with Monica Wild? Well, the thing is, is a, a lot of patients end up with Lyme disease, end up going to herbalists before they even come to see me. So sometimes I'll be referred patients from herbalists, you know, who don't suspect Lyme or, you know, you know. And then similarly, what I used to do when I first treated patients, I, I especially long-standing patients, I treat them with antibiotics, I treat them with some supplements and LDN, and then I send them on their way and they'd relapse. And you know, you know, a lot of Monica studied in America with Buner, uh, so the Buner protocol, um, and you know, the, there's a Cowden protocol in America as well. And the reason people went to herbs is because herbs work. But herbs are not as potent, I don't think, as antibiotics. You know, basically, antibiotics are just concentrated herbs. You know, if you look, you know, so so I think there's a, a role for herbal products in supporting people. You know, for example, there's a number of different supplements that I use that have been put together by Monica that, that help with the inflammation. You know, so besides LDN, um, you know, N-acetylcysteine, you know, can, can, can help, you know, there, there's lots of things going on at the cellular level. Um, you know, the, the probiotics can help because there's lots of things going on at the microbiome. You know, the, your immune system is mostly in your gut, not in your blood cells, you know? So I think, you know, I think there's clearly a role for a multidisciplinary team in terms of managing patients with these, with, with chronic Lyme. And yes, I do work with the herbalists as well because, Sometimes we work together. Sometimes they refer patients to me because their treatments aren't doing the job and my heavy duty antibiotics will, will, will do a better job of killing off the bacteria. And then sometimes when I've completed treatment or sometimes even when 
I told you two thirds of patients I treat, I think improve on the treatment, but one third don't. Um, I don't think that means you should give up on them. I think you should continue to work in terms, you know, trying to look at ways to, you know, improve their quality of life to relieve their symptoms. And I think, you know, herbalists have a role in that. You know, herbalists were treating patients with, you know, for infections before 1945, before penicillin was discovered by that Scotsman, you know, Alexander Fleming in London at St. Mary's Hospital, you know. So so herbalists have been managing infections for centuries. So I, I think I think we're all part of the same team. So on that note of, you know, one third of people don't get better, right? I think that's very consistent with what we're seeing with COVID, where some people get COVID, they get over it and they move on with life. Other people get COVID and they develop long COVID where they have persistent symptoms that are very similar to chronic Lyme symptoms, fatigue, brain fog, you know, potential, you know, depression, things like that, right? And there is this eerie connection and your work obviously is both in Lyme disease and COVID. So can you share with us what your thoughts are between the overlap of long COVID and chronic Lyme disease? Well, not exactly, but you know, I, I, I'm not really sure I have all the answers, but um, you know, the, the challenge is when you see somebody with suspected Lyme disease, you don't know whether they're still active infection or this is post-infectious. You really don't know. And if you look at the Hopkins, you know, Hopkins used the term that 20% of people after treatment don't get better. They call it PTLDS, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. But what infectious disease doctors do is they say this is, P stands for post-infectious, like the bacteria is gone. But you don't know if the bacteria is gone. P could stand for persistent infection, you know, um, you know, it, you know, so, so there still could be residual infection. And, and my opinion is, is there, there is, re, resi, re, there is residual infection. When I see patients, I select, I don't see everybody with chronic fatigue in the world. I see patients where I suspect there's a underlying bacterial infection driving this. So I try to select my patients. So I, I don't want to have them show up and say, I don't think you have Lyme. I'm not going to give you a course of treatment because I don't think this is helping you. So but 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 the two thirds that get better, um, I think there's an underlying bacterial infection. The one third that don't get better, maybe it's a biofilm. Maybe there's residual bacterial infection there. Maybe the bacteria is burned out. Maybe the symptoms are being caused by reactivation of viruses. You know, and that's what happens with long COVID. You know, with COVID, the virus is gone. You know but the immune system's been damaged and everybody has in their body viruses. You have herpes viruses, HSV1, HSV2, her HHV6, human herpes virus 6, VZs, Vs, the zoster virus, which is a herpes virus. People have Epstein-Barr virus, which is a, another herpes virus. People have CMV, which is another herpes virus. And we actually published this. One of my other doctors, we just published this in the last year, and we looked at the first wave of COVID, patients who ended up in the ICU, people who ended up in the CCU at my hospital, and about 10% of them got reactivated during the time that they were critically unwell in the, the, the high dependency unit or intubated in the ICU, 10% of them were getting reactivation of herpes, which is scarily similar to back in the day of HIV and AIDS, when people ended up in the ICU with HIV and AIDS, they were getting recurrent Shing outbreaks of shingles, they were getting outbreaks of perianal herpes, they were getting oral herpes, all this kind of stuff. But also, the ICU did PCR for CMV, PCR for um, Epstein Barr virus. And some of these people with COVID were getting reactivation of EBV and CMV um, in the setting of acute COVID, and their lymphocytes were low which is the critical part. When your lymphocytes go low, you get immune dysregulation and you can get reactivation of viruses. So I think there's a possibility that some of the patients that come to me with Lyme disease, maybe there's bacterial infections that were not hitting with the antibiotics or the second possibility, they're just so immunocompromised, they're getting reactivation of all these endogenous viruses. And some of their symptoms may be caused by that as well. But we really don't know because we don't have good we don't have the diagnostics or we don't have the studies to prove that it's all theoretical. But it sounds like you, you would email us the presentation you're giving next month. And in your presentation, you did a study 
And you started this, I think, in May of 2022, early COVID days. And you found, like you noted, reactivated Epstein-Barr Epstein -Barr virus, many, you know, herpes viruses, the cytomegalovirus, right? All these opportunistic viruses that are active in people with long COVID, likely due to immune dysregulation, as we noted in Lyme disease. So if you're publishing studies about this in long COVID, and we see this in chronic Lyme disease, I think that's where the potential overlap is in the subset of chronic persistent patients is immune dysfunction and reactivated viruses. Would you agree that that's kind of where we're, where we're going for a subset no, no, I think of the I, people? I agree. I think that's where we're going. But show me the publications from all the Lyme literate physicians. Right. There aren't. None. And, 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 they, and they stand up and they say, and you go to the highlights presentations and they say, we do all these tests and this test. So patients order tests and they're positive for EBV, and they're positive for CMV, and they're positive for HHV-8, and they're positive for Coxsackie viruses, and they're told these viruses are causing your symptoms. But we don't know because they're antibody tests. Right. I suspect they might be, but we need PCR tests. We need virus-specific tests to really prove that point. So we kind of preach that to patients, but we don't have the proof. I've looked at the literature in long COVID, lots of money, lots of research have gone into that. We've got the proof that that's part of what's happening with long COVID. I suspect that's the same kind of thing that's happening with, you know, patients with chronic Lyme. Um, you know, additionally, I think the presentation I sent you, that if you look at the PET scans of patients with long COVID and the PET scans of patients with chronic Lyme, there's the same, uh, very similar abnormalities in the brain. There's hypoperfusion defects in part of the brain that are signaling a lot of the same symptoms, you know, the dysautonomia, the, the pain, the respiratory centers, or, you know, the cerebellum, the balance centers, the, the parts of the brain that are affected in chronic Lyme based on PET scan studies are very similar to the abnormalities you find in long COVID. Just about, you know, with your research in COVID, obviously we believe that Lyme can persist in many people, likely. And and also we know that the immune compromised state leads to reactivation of viruses and that can cause illness as well. And I also think we agree that it could be a persistent infection, which results in immune dysfunction causing reactivation of viruses while you still have an active infection that persisted of Lyme disease. Do you think that's true in the COVID world as well, that the actual viral infection persists and also at the same time results in immune dysfunction causing even more reactivated viruses that were previously managed by your immune system. I, you know, I was at a presentation today and, you know, immunocompromised patients, you know, there's patients who are, you know, bone marrow transplant patients who are persistently positive for COVID, both by PCR and culture, you know, 45 days down the way. I don't think as a rule, looking at most of the studies is that patients still have reservoirs of COVID in their body. We might be wrong, but I, th I think our understanding of the coronavirus is, is they die out. So it's a post-infectious inflammatory autoimmune condition. And with Lyme disease, you know, I treat long COVID and Lyme, chronic Lyme the same way, except I don't use antibiotics. But then every now and then you will get patients with long COVID whose immune system you know, gets so low that they are getting, I think, probably reactivation of subclinical bacterial infections, whether it's Lyme disease, whether it's Bartonella, um, whether it's mycoplasma, chlamydia, some of these intracellular pathogens, you know, we, we, we hypothesize that this is what could be happening. Um, we've, we've got lots of resources to prove it with long COVID. We've got no resources to prove it with long Lyme. And this is this this is this is a frustration, I think. So let's talk about how you do treat people because you talked about with Lyme disease again, it's a combination of antibiotics. You do certain supplements like you know to help the immune system and allow a detox. I think you were kind of talking about some of those those supplements. Potentially, you integrate an herbalist and some herbal treatment as well, or you can refer them out after the fact, or they get referred to you. And then the key here was also you talked about that you really like to use low dose naltrexone, right? And when people Google that, it gets kind of scary because it's like if you have if you have an opioid addiction, you take low you take naltrexone to block the opioid receptors so you can't get a high, I believe. Is that correct from certain drugs? No, no. If you no? like well, you know, I, I work in inner city Dublin, so I, I take care of 
drug overdoses all the time. I, I, I work I work in the emergency room and I see people not breathing because they've overdosed, you know, and you, you, you give them injection of Narcan, naloxone, 50 milligrams. And it's not a narcotic, it's an anti-narcotic. So it blocks the opiate receptors. And all of a sudden you wake up, you start breathing again, you know, you, 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 you're not in coma anymore. So, 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 so naltrexone, 50 milligrams is used as an antidote of people who overdose on narcotic medications. And like I said, there's a lot of studies that have come out going back to the 1980s of using low dose naltrexone. So it's kind of an off license indication and it has some kind of anti-inflammatory effect. It has some kind of immune modulating effect. And it was used placebo controlled trials in the early days of HIV and AIDS and it improved people's quality of life. It, you know, it helped the brain inflammation that everybody with HIV and AIDS died of. It helped, I think it helped repair the lymphocytes, you know, so, so the lymphocytes were less dysfunctional. Better to do that than to give them an IV morphine drip and let them die, you know, they, at least they'd have a quality of life. Subsequently, their studies have been done with LDN, with rheumatologists, with neurologists, you know, so their studies look in placebo-controlled trials, looking at people with atypical MS. And when they actually did brain scans, you know, if you do brain scans of people with MS-like lesions, they've got these little white spots in the brain, you know, T2-weighted, you know, signals in the MRIs and this and that. And when you gave them LDN, six months later, the white spots disappeared and the funny neurology they had improved. Um GI specialists use use it for Crohn's disease because they don't need to use the same amount of immunosuppression if they use LDN. LDN has some immunomodulating effects. So LDN has been used for 20 years for other disease areas. And three years ago, when I was managing patients with COVID at my hospital, we are the National Isolation Unit of Ireland. I was the director of the National Isolation Unit from 2010, 2018. So any Ebola-like illness will come to our hospital. When, when the first COVID cases came to Ireland in March, 2020, we admitted them when the first, and then our staff ended up in the ICU because they became infected, you know? So, so I, I established a long COVID clinic to manage mostly the staff from my hospital and we probably saw about 800, 900 patients with long COVID along the way. And I just followed them every three months thinking they were going to get better and they didn't get better. And I knew LDN worked for Lyme patients, anti-inflammatory effect, immune modulating effects. So I started using it in just some of my, the staff that I was working with coming to the long COVID clinics and it appeared to be helping them. So then I did a pilot study that's published. We actually published it. Uh, it's the only published study, I think, on any therapeutic for long COVID um, in the world. And we, we we took a cohort of 60 patients, did a questionnaire before and after start COVID patients. And they'd be people sick for an average of 333 days. And with two months of starting the LDN, the brain fog got better, the concentration got better, the generalized pain got better, the headache got better, the mood get better, the sleep disturbances get better. So it has some kind of anti-inflammatory effect. So we did a pilot on LDN for long COVID. Um, and, and you know, that there's going to be big placebo-controlled trials done in the future for, for long COVID. But some patients have been sick for, you know, three years with long COVID now. And it's a very safe product. LDN is a very safe product. The worst thing it does for some people it sometimes gives people funny dreams it usually improves their sleep but sometimes it can give people psychedelic dreams you know three-dimensional dreams and this and that but the, the side effects are minimal and i would say about 80 percent of patients with long covid benefit from ldn over a period of two to four to six months and so i think it's a you know i my clinical observation is it helps long covid patients my clinical observation it helps chronic Lyme patients because it's working on the two other eyes. The antibiotics work on the infection, LDNs working on the other two L eyes, and it helps most patients. And it's a very safe option. Like I say, it's like taking Smarties. It's very safe and you can take it for years and years.
So but I just want to circle back to one question before Rich picks it up. And that is, you talked about your crypto your crypto conference. And I know, I know I'm kind of going back here, but why did you name your conference Crypto Conference for you know, infectious disease and Lyme disease? It seems like an interesting name. I'm curious the genesis of where that came yeah. from. It was, a, it was a French thing. So it wasn't my, I actually don't like the term personally, but it was the, the, the brainchild of doing the crypto conference came from Christian Perron in Paris. And it's looking at cryptic infections. Cryptic infections are hidden infections, you know? So, so, so crypt is a term that, that's used to describe hidden infections. So I think, you know, it's an occult infection, you know? Most patients with Lyme disease, like I said, I think we miss 85% of the cases. 15% of people remember the tick, less than 50%, maybe 30% get the rash. The antibody test is only positive in 50% of cases. So Lyme disease diagnosed late is a cryptic infectious, infection. It's an occult infection. It's a hidden infection. So that is the genesis of the word crypto infection. It's, it's kind of a, it was a French, uh, you know, kind of uh, orchestrated, uh, title that I thought to change with Christian Perron. Um, but since it was his idea to, to do the conference uh, originally, we stuck with it. So Dr. Amber, can you talk with us about some of the other tools that folks in the community may want to consider using when dealing with um, uh, infections, uh, dealing with infl inflammation and immune dysfunction, uh, other than other than antibiotics and uh, and uh, low dose uh, naltrexone. Yeah, well, you know, so so NEC, N-acetyl, you know, a lot of patients with long COVID get the, what I call kind of the PEM, the post-exertional malaise, mitochondrial crashing. So I think you need to part part of the solution is repairing the mitochondria. So using Glutathione can be helpful. I I I tend to use NAC and acetylcysteine. So NAC is converted to glutathione, and and N acetyl has antioxidant, has liver protection values. So I see NAC is part part of the solution as well, and I use that for both long COVID and for chronic Lyme. Um, I mentioned the microbiome. There's studies been done. You know, so if you're on combination antibiotics, you should be on probiotics. There's a yogurt drink that called kefir that people commonly take. So it's, it's protecting the gut. But also, um, kefir is a yogurt drink that Eastern Europeans use for chronic fatigue syndrome, used for fibromyalgia. If you take, if you manipulate your gut, you change the microbiome. And that's critically important, you know? So, so I think... So doing things to dietary changes can be important as well. I'm not a dietitian, so I say take a probiotic or take kefir as part of the solution. Anti-inflammatories, you know, patients with Lyme have headaches that are unrelieved by, by pain medications. They have joint pain that's unrelieved by narcotic pain medicines. I, you know, I recommend they take turmeric with black pepper, natural anti-inflammatories seems to help, you know? So, so there's a, so, so, you know, there's like like I said I don't I don't have a set recipe for any patient you know I I I you know one of my patients gave me uh, a paper uh, a book on uh, Arctic root on Rodolia rosea which is a herbal product that is that Russian doctors prescribe uh, for brain for concentration you know so so if you do your homework you find out that you know I found patients benefit from uh, you know, from from those kind of products for sleep in Ireland, they give people people with sleep disturbances uh, with Lyme disease of sleep disturbances, people with long COVID of sleep disturbances. You know, you give them, you know, some of the uh, narc, you know, the 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 addictive sleeping medicines. They it dopes them up for days and end. I I preferentially use melatonin. Melatonin, you know, is used for you know, kids with behavioral problems. It's used for patients with brain injuries, you know. It helps regulate their sleep pattern. I call it a sleep hormone rather than a sleeping pill. It's not addicting. It's a very safe thing to take, um, you know. Um, so, so you know, so, so I don't have one recipe. I individualize my treatment, but you have to dress, you know, you have to dress diet, you have to dress sleep, you have to dress the mitochondria, you have to dress inflammation, you have to address the immune system. And then 
you have to kill the bacteria, you know, um, at, you know, as opposed to stun the bacteria. And, and as an infectious disease doctor, you know, I kind of have my, I don't have a set recipe of what antibiotics I use. Um, but I use different antibiotics, um, you know, including antibiotics that have good penetration intracellular drugs like azithromycin, drugs like rifampicin, in combination with the standard antibiotics. But like I said, I don't have a, a set recipe. It's not like a, you know, a Chinese menu, one of A and one of B and one of C, which some actually private clinics have. You know, I try to individualize care based on what patients will tolerate and you know what what symptoms they have. You know, Dr. Lambert, it always scares me when, when we interview folks who essentially have a recipe type approach. And, and the reason that always makes me anxious is because we're going to have a different combination of microbes. We talked about this earlier um, mm -hmm. that are going to be spit into you by one or more uh, tick bites. Uh, we're going to have a different combination of microbes that our body has already been harboring. And when, you, yeah. when you're putting those two things together, you're just never going to have the same footprint in any individualized person who is sick with Lyme disease. So, you know, if, if you walk into this with a recipe, I think it's, I think that's, again, to, you know, to use the term, it's a recipe for disaster. Right. No, no absolutely. And like even, even antivirals, I don't, as a rule, I don't use antivirals because the best, you know, I think that the underlying problem is a bacterial infection as a rule. Now, sometimes you can get reactivation of viruses. Right. How do you how do you manage that? Repair the immune system. You know, if you have a transplant patient who's getting reactivation of CMV or reactivation of the herpes viruses, you drop their immunosuppression so that they don't reject their transplant, but they're not severely immunosuppressed. You you, you stop. You know, if somebody gets COVID and they're a transplant patient, you you cut back on the transplant medications so that they can recover from COVID. So I I try not to treat viruses, but sometimes if you've got somebody who's got recurrent shingles all the time, you know, despite, you know, being treated, I sometimes put them on antiviral suppression, understanding that you're never going to cure the shingles, but at least if you suppress the shingles, that gives, gives, their, gives them time to work, take all the other supplements to repair the immune system system so it gives their body some time to recover so like i said i don't i don't have a set recipe i just have an approach i appreciate that and and, and i love that approach so can we talk about the relationship between treating infection treating inflammation and treating immune dysfunction because one of the things that we're always anxious about on this podcast is the impact that the use of long-term antibiotics is having on the immune system, specifically the impact that it's having on your gut. Now, you had shared earlier that 70% of the immune system or a large percent of the immune system is in the gut. And when we're taking antibiotics, especially long-term, we are altering, um, we're, we're altering the gut biome and therefore altering our immune, um, uh, you know, our immune system. So how do we strike that balance between um, between infection control and immunosuppression from having the use of uh, of antibiotics long term. Well, well, I tend to downplay that. You know, I, I use the example of tuberculosis. Patients with in India, there are two point five million cases of tuberculosis a year. If they don't take four antibiotics for six to twelve months, they die. They never say, oh, doctor, should I really take those antibiotics because they're going to damage my immune system? They say, thank you, doctor, for saving my life. So, sure. you know, so anyway, so that's, so I'm just saying that's, 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 that's one perspective, you know, um, four antibiotics for one year, 2.5 million people, you know, that they, they do that because it's necessary. Um, so you have to do things to protect your gut, you know, along, along the way. And, and I actually just saw a presentation recently on long COVID, patients with COVID and long COVID, their, the microbiome, their, their gut flora is destroyed, you know, and maybe that's part of the, maybe that's part of the problem with long COVID. Maybe it's not just the, the immune system and the bloodstream, it's the gut immunity that, that's a problem as well. So you have to protect the gut. But when you stop those antibiotics, your gut goes back to normal if you replenish you know, the normal gut bacteria. 
you, you get overgrowth of candida if you take antibiotics. I put people, especially women who are prone to thrush, I put them on once weekly antifungals, you know, because otherwise they get mucocutaneous candidiasis, you know. So you have to kind of, you know, so, so I would say antibiotics kill bacteria. That's number one priority, you know. And you have you do what you can to limit the damage. You know, you know you take rifampicin, you can it can cause liver damage. How often does that happen? In thousands of people, I've treated. I've had to stop rifampicin about maybe ten times out of two thousand. So it's 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 a rare phenomena, you know. But you have to monitor bloods to make sure there's no there's no toxicities. I used to say one in a hundred people get side effects from the antibiotics, you know, kidney problems or liver problems or, you know, blood count problems, I would say it's one in 500. It's rare. It's, it's quite rare. If, you know, if you monitor the bloods and you you change things around. So, yes. So, antibiotics kill bacteria. It, it can affect, antibiotics don't attack your generalized immune system, but they do affect the, 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 the gut microbiome. And you have to do everything you can to keep the gut microbiome healthy. And I've I've given you my recipe: probiotics, kefir, you know those kind of products, and, and a healthy diet. Now, one of the things that we really enjoyed about doing our research on you before the podcast, and of course you built this out during the course of the podcast, is that you you like to work with herbalists, right? You you take this you take this um, uh, approach where you have many different disciplines coming together and working with the patient. And I'm just wondering when you sort of step down the antibiotics, which you argue is a more aggressive form of killing, um, killing the bacteria. And when you when you begin to introduce the herbal treatments, which are not as aggressive in your view at, at treating the bacteria, but can um, can be uh, effective tools when uh, the um, when the bacteria is is better managed, which would then have in most cases. Um, a, a less severe impact on the uh, on the gut and the immune system. Right. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, like I said, before 1945, herbalists treated infections. And if you look at products like artisiminin, which is acti activity against Lyme, you know, the pharmaceutical companies take, art, take the plant, purify it and turn it into artisumate, which is, uh, uh, you know, which is one of the mainstays of the treatment of malaria. So concentrated plants are used by pharmaceutical companies all the time, you know. So, 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 so I, I think that even when I treat people who have been, my thinking is sometimes when I treat people for a year with antibiotics, if they've been sick for ten years, I'm not sure I've hundred percent eradicated every bacteria that is pathogenic in their body. So, I think transitioning to a herbalist is, makes perfect sense because some of the herbal products. Cryptolepsis, which is another product, you know, artisiminin, resveratrol, you know, Japanese knotweed, they have they have broad spectrum activity, not just against Lyme, but against the polymicrobial infections. And actually, you can treat with one herbal product, you can treat multiple different infections if those infections are still there. And I used to just stop antibiotics, and I would say 10, 20% of people would come back in a period of six months haven't gone backwards. And I think that happens much less now when I, especially with longer standing infections, when I when I discharge people from my treatment regime, I turn them over to the herbalists and I stay in touch with them through the herbalists. Then sometimes the herbal products fail and they have to come back for another course of antibiotics. And sometimes they're 80% better. And over a year of working with a the herbalist, they improve to 90% or higher, and eventually come off all the herbs and the LDN as well. So I I, I think there you know I, I think it's important to understand that um, you know as a medical doctor we we don't have all the answers, um, and some of the other you know professions that we work with um, ha have really important contributions to make as well. And I think herbalists are are part of that team. So what, one of the things we've looked at is um, is the pattern of um, many of the successful people who are who are managing Lyme disease, and, and we've actually called this pattern the PARM pattern, where there are people who go through a process of prehabilitation, where they're getting themselves ready and they're getting their bodies ready 
through a number of different tools, including detoxification tools. Um, then they go through this phase where they are they are aggressively killing um, the, the 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 microbes, uh, and then because of so many of the changes that occur in the body, even at a genetic um, or an epigenetic level and at, on a neurological level, that they have to go through a phase of uh, rehabilitation. Um, and then finally, this sort of a maintenance phase. So what would your reaction be to um, you know, a, an approach where people are first preparing for the kill, then going through the kill phase, then, then going through a, a rehabilitation phase, and then a maintenance phase um, as, as an approach to um, treating uh, chronic Lyme disease? Well, by the time patients come to see me, they've, they've kind of gone very often. They've gone many, many different places before. So when yeah. they come to me, they want to start treatment right away. Most of them, most of them want to start right away because they're just tired of being disbelieved or being sick, you know, and this and that. So I had a huge impact in the life. And I always say half the patients that come to me have psychiatric problems because they get neuroinflammation. The other half have psychiatric problems from being disbelieved or treated yeah. badly by the healthcare system, you know, so that most of them are, you know, want to go on treatment, but some of them actually say, I don't want to go on antibiotics. You know, I don't because they'll hurt my immune system. They'll, you know, they'll destroy my gut flora. And I, and I, and I, and you you know, I'm not going to force people to go on antibiotics. I, I still st step back to the point that the best way to kill a bacteria is with antibiotics, not prey, like the Christian scientists in Boston do. Um, you know, antibiotics have the role and it's the best way to go. But some people don't want to go the antibiotics route right now. So I'm quite happy to say, OK, well, let's focus on the other two parts of the, the you know, the disease and then maybe start off working with a herbalist, you know. So I, I think people, you just have to engage patients, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and work with them to come up with the solutions. So, you know, I have patients that want to go off on holiday and say, well, I don't want to start the treatment now in case I have side effects. I say, well, start on the LDN, start in the supplements and come back in three months and we'll start the antibiotics then. So I think you have, you have to negotiate with patients in terms of what, what the best strategy is, you know, in terms of what's right for them. But most of my patients, want to start on combination antibiotics yesterday because many of them have seen that the antibiotics helped them and they were denied longer course antibiotics and and when they stopped the antibiotics they went backwards you know um so so they so they, so so they they know the antibiotics work and they seem to have more common sense than people who are following the guidelines they they seem to understand <laughs> that that you know that, that a longer course is antibiotics is is what it takes and for any other disease i, I keep on saying if you went to your gp with an earache an ear infection and took a 10-day course of antibiotics got better then the ear pain came back again they'd give you more antibiotics you know um you know and it's a it's frustrating i think for patients to be told you can't receive more antibiotics you've had your dose you're cured you know so most people want to start treatment right away Dr. Lambert, have you had folks who have not uh, done well with the course of antibiotics because they were immunocompromised for some other reasons, for example, because they were they were living in a moldy environment or because they were harboring uh, heavy metals? Yeah. Well, see, see, I'm 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 not a functional medicine doctor. I don't, you know, the only heavy metals I I I I, I do maybe Pink Floyd, you know, um, but but no, but, but uh, joking. Um, but no, I don't understand. Look, but and molds, you know, like like some people think that they have molds all over their body. I think molds can affect your immune system. So it's part of the three eyes. If you're in a moldy environment, it can damage your immune system. So you have to sort that problem. But the the cure, I have a lot of patients say, Well, I've got candida throughout my body. Give me an antifungal. Well, no. I still get back, to, I get parasites, give me a parasitic agent. I, I still get back to the point that Lyme is the problem here. Lyme made you immunocompromised. Let's focus on Lyme repairing the immune system. You know, you don't need heavy duty antifungals for a year. You know, right. I, you know I, I still get back to the point that we really need to focus on the crux of the matter. 
the crux of the matter is a bacterial infection called Borrelia and other similar infections, co-infections, that can create this cascade of immunosuppression, immunodysfunction, reactivation of other infections, acquisition of other infections, you know. I, I think I think really the I, I think we really need to focus on, you know, Lyme disease, you know, and as a bacterial infection and potentially a curable bacterial infection. The viruses we talked about are not curable. All you can do is repair the immune system to, you know, to 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 um you know put the viruses back in their cage. Um, unfortunately, some people just their gut doesn't tolerate the antibiotics. That's really the only situation where, you know, I would say 95% of people can tolerate the antibiotics if you prepare the gut. Um, but there is that 5% that just can't take the antibiotics. And that's the challenge. In that situation, IV is the only option, but it's hard to get IVs in most places. And IVs are only available for, you know, some of the antibiotics, but not for most of the other co-infections. So how do you deal with that? So that is where I come up to my biggest challenges when pa when patients gut can't tolerate the antibiotics, then I can't really assess, you know, when I see patients in day one, I say 70% chance you're going to respond to the treatment, but I don't know if you have active Lyme or not. Your history is suspicious. Your blood tests look like you've been exposed to Lyme. The two interpretations are, you either have an active infection or you have had an infection in the past. You know, ask me in four months whether you have Lyme disease. At that stage, I'll be able to see whether you respond to the antibiotic treatment. And that really is my approach is let's do a trial of a treatment with the understanding that 70% of people respond to the treatment. If you don't respond, it doesn't make sense to push the antibiotics ad nauseum. It makes sense to step back a little bit and we look at the situation and try to go on a different avenue to, to get people better. I, I don't just kind of kick people out the door. I try to continue to work with them. Um, and that includes working with the herbalists and others who may do a better job of managing patients if my treatments don't don't work. Dr. Lambert, we really, we really love the work that you're doing and you have been doing. We love the personalized medicine that you've been practicing for decades, although it's now becoming, you know, folks are trying to catch up to your, your, your approach to personalized medicine, but it really is, it's just a brilliant approach that you've been taking. And, you know, you've really blessed us and our listeners with, uh, with, with so much insight. So uh, we can't thank you enough. And we did make the commitment to you that we would not go beyond the two hour mark. And since we're only three minutes away from that, I'm, I am going to wind down the podcast by asking you how folks can get in touch with you if they wanted to work with you at um, at your at your hospital. So I, I have a secretary, all my emails just go through admin at iddoctor.eu. So admin for administrator at id, d-o-c-t-o-r dot e-u. So, so patients can just contact me through through that and then like i said if if there's an international audience audience looking here i also work with the lyme resource center and we're working on signage you know putting signs up to make people aware that there are ticks all over the uk and ireland because they're not signs and we're also working on education you know for for gps so if people are interested both in terms of personally for their care or volunteering for the effort, they can reach me through the admin ID email.